Hey guys, Roger here, pastor of Preaching and Vision at Matthew's Table. We're glad that you decided to join us and tune in to see our service. Uh, I would say that this isn't something that we hope you replace your local church with, but this is something to uh, just build on that and encourage you and help you see Jesus in a bigger, better way. I'm Pastor Nick Martin, Pastor of Discipleship and Outreach. And we pray this just blesses you and grows you in your relationship with Christ. Living waters of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray we drink in deep from that well. You are enough. Thank you, God. Help us to be content and satisfied in you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thirty. That sounded like it. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. Now, um, before I get started, like I know Roger already did announcements, but like for the men and women in here, like uh, we do men's and women's Bible study every Sunday morning at 9:45, and you know, like it's women getting in the Word together, men getting in the Word together. And I would just highly suggest, like, you trying to plug into men's and women's Bible study. And also, like, this month we have uh, a, men's, a men's night on the 13th, a, a, a women's uh, a conference on the uh, 18th. So there's, like, all this, uh, types of things that we can plug into that, you know, like, as they were singing the song, Jesus is enough. Like, I often have to ask myself that, like, do I make Jesus priority? Is he enough? And if not, because like yesterday, like I spent hours watching college football, you know. I spent uh, time, you know, I was up late last night watching the game. And like we can find time to do any and everything else. Like let's be a people that make time to spend with Jesus. Uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, today. I thank you that you are enough. I thank you for the people that woke up early to come and worship you. I just thank you that you are so good. I pray for everyone all across the world experiencing persecution when they gather. I pray that as we get together today in light of our brothers and sisters are being persecuted, that we have eyes for you, that we have a heart for you that we burn for you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you missed the three-day rally, you missed out. One person, yeah, yeah. But if you really, like, if you missed the three-day rally, you missed out. All week, like, it refueled me, it re-energized me, it revived me, and all week, I just thought of lyrics that they sang in one of the songs, and it was, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. Like that one sentence this week alone has made me cry. It's made me look to Jesus. It's made me worship. And it's took me back on a journey to look at the, the pits of hell that Jesus brought me out of. So as they was singing that song, I remember like exactly, I was standing over here and there was people crying at the altar and, and the worship was just, all my life you have been faithful. And it was just like a timeline of my life going through my head of, you know, whether it was me being in jail, me being at the end of my rope, whether it's me, you know, losing it all and looking back and seeing Jesus at the center of it all and just thinking all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. See, worship is not just words to sing along to. So like what we did this morning, like Jesus, you are enough, and the, the other songs they sang, it's not just words we sing along to, like, okay, we did our three songs, and now it's time to preach. 
Worship is so much more than that. Like, did you know this? Did you know the man who wrote Amazing Grace wrote it after God saved his ship from a bad storm at sea where everyone should have died? Like, he wrote Amazing Grace as the storm calmed down and he penned the famous words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Like he wasn't just trying to uh, create, like what's gonna be a song that they like? What's gonna be something that everyone will enjoy? Like he wrote that from a pure place of worship. And then there's other old hymnals like Blessed Assurance, one of my favorites. Did you know that do y'all know Blessed Assurance? Yeah, a few of y'all. Blessed Assurance. We had an old guy who was in jail, and an old guy, he came in every week, and he sang Blessed Assurance. Song of the sermon, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is my... Okay, okay. But y'all get it. That's how Blessed Assurance goes. But here's the story behind Blessed Assurance, which is so good. Did you know that the lady that wrote it was blind since she was six weeks old because a janky doctor did something wrong? The lady that wrote Blessed Assurance was blind since she was six weeks old. She was visiting a friend's house one day when her, when her friend asked her, she, they said, what does this tune sound like to you? So I'm assuming like she was probably on the piano. Hey. Fanny, her name was Fanny Crosby, what does this sound like? Fanny Crosby said, let me pray about it for a minute. So blind Fanny Crosby, she prays about it, and she got up, and she said, this tune sounds like blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. She wasn't writing that so you would be impressed. She was writing that from a place of worship. Like, think about how she felt being blinded since she was six weeks old, and she pins the chorus, what does this tune sound like? And she says, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Hundreds of years later, we're still singing these songs in church. As I have this week of all my life, God has been faithful. All week that one sentence has sent chills down my neck. It does something to my heart because those all my life uh, you have been faithful are not just words to me. They mean something. They point me to God's faithfulness. Then there's one more song I'm going to tell you the story about. It's also one of my other favorite hymnals. What a friend we have in Jesus. Before I tell you that story, though, I really want us to slow down and, and think about how powerful that statement is. What a friend you have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. He's a friend to the sinner. He's a friend that sticks close. He's a, he's a friend that never leaves. And I, and I ask you, like, do you think that the man that wrote this song had it all together? Like, do you think this was a, a, a man that had his life perfect because he wasn't? The man's name was Joseph Scriven. At one point in Joseph's life, he had wealth and a good family and an overall good life in Ireland. He was living the, the dream, you could say. He went to the Marines. He was a teacher. He was about to get married, and then his life flipped upside down. The night before Joseph was going to get married, his fiance she drowned to death. On the night before their, their wedding, his fiance drowned to death. So looking for a fresh start, Joseph says, man, I'm going to move from Ireland to Canada to kind of start over. And in Canada, he finds another woman that he falls in love with. But weeks before that wedding, his new fiance, she, she gets sick and then she suddenly dies. She, she dies too. So shattered again, what does Joseph do? 
He turns to Jesus, and his life was never the same. Joseph began to sell everything he had, and he lived the rest of his life to take care of the poor and handicapped. The man that lost his first fiancé the night before the wedding and his second fiancé weeks before the second wedding, he would start to give away all of his clothes and possessions to people in need and help the handicapped without ever asking for money. Ten years after his second fiancé died, his mother then became deathly sick And because of his vow to live his life serving others in Canada, he couldn't afford to travel back to Ireland to be with her. Feeling the need to just do something, to send his mom something, he writes a prayer and a poem, What a Friend You Have in Jesus. It was all he could do since he couldn't make it there himself. Later, Joseph then becomes sick himself, and as a friend came to visit, he noticed his words scribbled on a piece of paper, and his friends asked Joseph, hey, who wrote this beautiful poem? And Joseph replied, the Lord did it between him and I. That poem, that song, meaning more than words, but comfort to himself, others, and his dying mother was the old hymn sung in churches all across the world today, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So the question that I have for us as a church body As followers of Jesus, as we look today to Matthew 7, 7 through 12, is why we don't carry everything, and I mean everything, to God in prayer. So why don't we carry everything to God in prayer? Why don't we go to him more often? Why don't we see those beautiful words more clearly? What a friend we have in Jesus. Matthew 7 7 through 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It's the word of the Lord. As I've thought about those five verses, I honestly couldn't help But look back over my life and see that all my life God has been faithful. I've thought about his amazing grace this week. The blessed assurance and the friend that I have in Jesus. If you've been going through the Sermon of the Mount with us, verse by verse, things that Jesus tells us to do, if we was to be honest, they're not always easy to do. Like even these last few weeks, Jesus tells us, hey, You put God over money. He says to judge not. He says, don't worry. And if the disciples are anything like me, I'm thinking like, yeah, Jesus, that's pretty hard to do. Like this week alone, I I probably struggled with more than once on judging correctly. I probably struggled more than once on not worrying. I probably struggled with uh, placing money over God. Like I probably failed at these multiple times this week alone. One thing that I'll admit, if you already didn't know, is I'm not the perfect friend. I'm not the perfect husband. I'm not the perfect father. I'm not the perfect pastor. Salty said he knows. And overall theme in my life is the reminder of I just have the perfect Savior. Like, I just have a perfect Jesus. Like, I just have a perfect God who saves me in spite of myself. When Jesus says in verses 7 through 12, for us to ask, seek, and knock, the promise is that all three of those will receive a response. So when Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock, 
We need to remember this. There are no missed calls in the kingdom of God. So when we ask Jesus, he's not missing your call. When, when, when we knock, he's not, not hearing it. When we seek, he, he, he's not ignoring us. The insanity, though, is sometimes we treat God like the famous Verizon wireless commercial. Y'all know what I'm talking about? What is Verizon's commercial? Do you hear me now? Like if we was to be real, we can treat God like that, right? Like, God, do you hear me now? Do you, and then, and then we think, well, let me try it this way. Let me, let me switch around my words. Let me, let me really dig in and pray. God, do you hear me now? And we think he's going to say back, good. Like, right? Like we really can treat God like, God, are you getting my list? Are my prayers coming through? Do you hear me now? Maybe you felt like that too. Maybe you just feel like your prayers aren't getting heard. Maybe you feel like nothing's changing. Maybe you feel like, why I keep on praying? But that's where Jesus reminds us in these verses how good of a father he is. Verses 9, 10, 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things who ask him? Do you see that God tells us to ask? You are not bugging him. You are not interrupting him. And he hears you quite clear. He says, if evil people who do good for his son... How much more will your Father in heaven give good things of those who ask him? If you want to receive, you ask. If you want to find, you seek. If you want the door open, you knock. Asking is the act of making a request as, a, as an expression of dependence. And I think one of the reasons we don't ask is because we try to depend upon ourselves. We, we think that we have the solution. We think that we have the answers. We think we can fix it. So we don't like to depend on God. We think that we have the solutions. And if we don't, we play phone tag with people that we think that do. If you ever seen the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? At some point when they get stuck, they'll say, hey, you get a lifeline. You ever seen that show? Yeah. So someone, a lifeline is someone you call for assistance. And in my opinion, and hopefully yours too, it's quite foolish not to use the lifeline, right? Like, think about if I got this question. What year did Friends of Sinners start? And I had a lifeline left. That was my final question to win a million dollars. And I had just one lifeline left. So I'm reading the options, and it's like 1998, 2008, 2018, or neither. So you see me, I'm sitting in the chair, sweating, thinking about it, wondering what should I do. I'm stressing, and the host of the show reminds me, Nick, this is your final question. If you get it right, you win a million dollars. If you get it wrong, you lose. If you were watching that show, and I didn't use my landline to call Roger, and I guessed incorrectly, he would be like, Nick is the foolish guy on earth. Like, Nick is crazy. Why didn't he just call Roger? That would be crazy not to call right or even call, like, somebody else, like, uh, hey, Rob Martin, you, you got the answer to when Friends of Center started? I think I'm going to use my lifeline on you. Like, that would be crazy, right? Because I know the guy that knows the answer to the question. Like, I know the guy that started Friends of Sinners, and I have his number in my phone. So you would say I was foolish for not calling him, especially if I lost a million dollars on that question. So as you think about that, in the same way as followers of Christ, is it crazier that in my hypothetical game, I didn't call Roger, or in real life, we don't call upon God, who has even way more answers. God Promises in those these verses, he's answering what we ask. 
He gives good gifts and that he's a better father than we could ever imagine. So the question that I have for Matthew's table is, why are we not using our lifeline? Why are we not calling upon God? Because do you know we have access to the one who created it all? We have access to the one who, who tells us he listens to our prayers, he sees what we need, and, and that his lifelines don't run out. Like, I remember my brother, he got a P Metro phone, and anytime he went through like a cloudy place, he'd be like, I can't hear you. But sometimes, like, we treat God like that, right? Like, when, I'm sorry if you got P Metro, but that was just the experience I had with my brother. Like, I could never hear him. But, like, like, think about, like, we treat God like that. Like, when we're going through a rough place or a rough patch or a cloudy area, we think, like, oh, God, you're blocked off. You can't hear me now. I got poor signal. Let me, che let me, let me check my connection. Like, God doesn't miss calls. He doesn't have a connection problem. God doesn't have a signal problem. He's not missing your calls. He's not putting you on hold. He's not saying, let me deal with the bigger issue than you. Like some of us, if we was to be, be real, we could think, we think like that, like God's got so much more important things to do than deal with little old Nick Martin. Like he's got the hurricane to deal with. He's got uh, the pandemic to deal with. I'm not going to go to God with my prayers. Like he's got so much more things to deal with. And we treat God like that, right? So we call, we call um, everybody else for the answers. And we, and we watch talk shows and we hope they give us the answers when we have a God that has all the answers. So I'm telling you, you having problems, you go to God. You're struggling, you go to God. You're hurting, you go to God. You're having marriage problems, you go to God. You're having doubt problems, you go to God. Like, that's the answer is for us to ask, to us to seek, to, for, for us to knock at the door. Because Jesus says when we ask, we will, we will receive. When we seek, we will find. When we knock, the door will be open. Some of us go to everyone else and try to fix ourselves. When we know the God that knows it all, we know the God that can fix it all. We know the God that can change it all. Depending upon the wrong people for answers to our problems, it's like calling me to look at your engine when something's wrong with your car. Y'all heard the laugh. Like, that's like calling, like, you're on the side of the road, like, going through your phone, like, who am I going to call? Nick. I'll be like, well, you called the wrong. Like, we just going to both be looking on the side of the road. Like, I'm going to come, but, I, like, besides the oil change, I don't know what I'm looking for. Like, that's it. Like, you shouldn't call me if something is wrong with your car. If you're having car problems, who do you call? You call a mechanic or Brad. I'll give you his number if you're having car problems. No, i just kidding. If you're having computer problems, like, you probably need to call Computer Dave. Like, you need forgiveness, you call God. Like, some of us are, are calling all the wrong people. We're looking for solutions in all the wrong places. And our church would be so much better off. I really want y'all, our church to hear this. Our church would be so much better off if the next time one of our members are going through it, we didn't play call everyone else because we spent our time calling God about it. Like we did not spend our time calling everyone else about someone else's problem, but instead we spent our time calling God about it. Here's a challenge for us. Thank you, Skylar. Let it not be because we didn't pray that our brothers and sisters who have drifted don't come back home. Like, let it not be because we didn't pray. Let it not be because we didn't pray that lost people aren't getting saved. Let it not be because we didn't pray that we don't experience revival in our community. Many times, if we were to be real for a second, we turn to everything but God. As the book suggests, we can find ourselves praying about buildings and budgets rather than being a spiritually healthy church. We can find ourselves praying about um, all the wrong things. And if we're not careful, we can try to start doing things with our plans and our own abilities when God is the one that can truly open the door. So what we do like in trying to find the solutions is we usually dig a bigger hole. 
Like, that's what I do when I try to fix it myself. I usually make the problem worse. And I'll tell you a true story. Like, I'll tell you I'm the worst mechanically inclined person on earth. But one day, pride was in my way, and my tire went flat on the side of 81. And, like, people laugh at me when I call them about small issues. So I was like, I ain't going to call nobody. I'm going to fix my tire today. And, like, six hours later, my knuckles are bloody. And this is, like, my brother ran a tire shop. And I knew the whole time, like, man, you could call your brother, and he'll send a crew right out, and you'll be back on the road. But my pride was so high that day. I was like, I'm going to fix this tire, and I'm going to show them I can do it. All I did was made the, I made it worse. And I had bloody knuckles. And every time the car, like, it, it would just fall off the jack every time I'd start uh, spinning the lug nut. I'd be like, man, I know I'm doing something wrong. And then even that, like, I was embarrassed when the people got out there because they did it, like, in five seconds. It was like, pew, pew, new tire. So but that's like what we can do with our life, right, and our relationship with God is we know who to call. We know who has the answers, but pride will say, I can fix this problem myself. I can do this myself. I can, I can create the solution. But when my pride got out the way and I called my brother and he sent the crew, I was back on the road. It was like, a, they was, it was like NASCAR, really, how quick I was back on the road. And God taught me a lesson that day, like call people who have the answers. Like, Nick, you're not a mechanic. I didn't create you to be a mechanic. So our threefold request to ask, seek, and knock is met with a threefolded promise with receive, find, and open. God never stopped answering prayers. He still answers them today. And I often have to ask myself, why do I treat prayer as a last resort instead of a first, instead of a go-to? Like, why do I treat prayer in my life as a, an emergency response? Like, God, do you hear me now? Why is prayer not my go-to? Why am I not proactive in going to God in prayer? George Mueller had this to say on it. On the ground of our own goodness, we cannot ex expect to have our prayers answered. But Jesus is worthy. For his sake, we may have our prayers answered. There is nothing too choice, too costly, or too great for God to give to Jesus. He is worthy. He is the spotless, holy child who under all circumstance, circumstances acted according to the mind of God. And if we trust him, if we hide in Jesus, if we put Jesus forward and ourselves in the background, depend on him and plead his name, then we may expect to have our prayers answered. How did this George Mueller lived this out. He asked and he received. He seek and he found. He knocked and it was open to him. George Mueller really believed that God still answered prayers. And he lived his life like he believed that. And I'm wondering what's stopping us from living our lives in the same way. Like, do you really believe that the father has good things for his children? Do you really believe that he's a good father? Do we really believe what he says? Does this story sound like the way we live our lives? The children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat, the house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. So George heard that, but then he asked her, hey, go sit the children down in the dining room and have them sit at the tables. And then George Mueller started thanking God in advance for the food, and then he waited. George knew that God would provide food for the children as he always did. Let me repeat that. George knew God would provide food for the children as he always did. And look what happened. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked Three batches for you, and I'll bring it in. Soon after that, there was another knock on the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down, coincidentally, right in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed, so he asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for 300 thirsty children. 
in light of what I just read, what's stopping us from having that same dependence upon a holy God? Like, did you see what George Mueller did? He had the 300 children. There was no food in the place. There was no solution. Me, I would have been like, <laughs> let's go ask the grocery store. Let's take up a special offering. It said, George Mueller said, hey, y'all go sit down. And his first response was, let me thank God for the food and the, the meal he's about to provide. And within minutes, there was a knock on the door. Hey, I couldn't sleep. I heard you needed bread. Coincidentally, the milkman broke down right in front of the orphanage and provided all the milk. So I asked myself, like, why am I not depending upon God the same way? Because I've seen God answer prayers. Like, I'm an answered prayer. This building, like, I've seen God answer prayers. Like, this building is an answer prayers. Many of you sitting in here today are answered prayers. And now I ask us, what is going to happen next? Because the people of Matthew's table starting getting serious about prayer. Like, think about that for a moment. We as a church started looking at buildings, janky buildings, like roofs falling in buildings, like scary, like haunted houses type buildings. Like we started looking and decided like we can't afford these even. Like I don't know what we're going to do, God. And then we started praying. Like when your last resort, we was like, okay, good, we'll start praying. And now we're in a, a facility. Like my daughter, like one day she's going to ask me like, how did we end up at Buena Vista? And I'll get to tell her, like, we prayed. Like, we couldn't afford it. Like, if we would have got the call, hey, church is for sale. How much is it? Um, 50,000. Oh, well, we can't afford I'm sorry. We can't afford that. But, like, here's a free church. Y'all prayed. I respond. So I always ask myself, like, why am I not going to God in prayer more often? George Mueller testified that God had answered over 50,000 prayer requests in his lifetime, and 30,000 were answered on the same exact day. Like, he would write them down, answered prayer. Here's the prayer I prayed. Here's, the, here's how God answered. He, would, he had a journal of it. By prayer, here's what he did. He helped over 10,000 orphans. He said, I'm going to never fundraise. I'm going to never ask for money. Uh, I'm not going to depend upon the state. I'm not going to depend upon everybody else. He says, he said, uh, I'm going to prove that God is real because he's going to answer these prayers. Guess what the coolest thing about this orphanage is? It's still alive and well today. It's still doing the same thing today, and they've helped over 10,000 kids who didn't have a place to go. The whole time they was open, he raised money for them by prayer and, and, like, if I would, I would highly encourage you to read his book because it's so mind-blowing and it's so, like, reversing what the church does today. So they was in these old houses, and they just wasn't fit for the orphanage. So he creates this plan, like, let's build these facilities. Well, how are we going to do it? We don't have no money. We're going to pray. And within six months, these facilities were open. So when we spend time with God then I just think we'll start to pray more. Like, he'll start, the motivations of, of Christians start to change, right? Like, it doesn't become about what I want, but about what he wants. Like, it's not about what makes me happy anymore. It's about what makes me holy, what God wants of us. And he wants us to, he wants us to ask, seek, and knock. When we seek Jesus, what happens is our mindsets, our mindset shift from happiness to holiness. We go from all about me to all about him, and it becomes less about the gifts and more about the gift giver. Like, do you realize you have access to a faithful God, and I'm guilty of going to his throne like he isn't the most powerful being in this universe? Like, for real, like, God can save my brothers that are lost. Like, for real. Like, God can save my brothers who are still lost. Like, God can change this community around. He can bring revival to Owensboro. And my commitment is going to be, it's not going to be because I didn't ask. Like, it's not going to be because I didn't seek. 
It's not going to be because I didn't knock. It's not going to be because we didn't pray. And I have a personal question for us all. What's going to be different because you decided to pray? Like, what is going to be different because you got serious about prayer? How is your life going to change because you believed in the power of prayer? Let's look at Psalms 18.6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. There was no signal problem. He didn't miss the call. To my God, I cried for help. Look at his answer. From his temple, he heard my voice. There was no signal problem, and my cry to him reached his ears. Worship team can make their way up. I want to ask the something. What's been bothering you lately? Like, what's the, the struggle you, you, you've been facing? What, what's the... What's the worry that you have in your life, the, the crisis that you've been dealing with? And I want to ask us, like, how much time have you spent praying about it? How much time have you spent talking to God about it? How much time have you spent on your knees about it? Does it do something to us to consider that we never fight our battles alone? Like, we never have to war alone. We never have to struggle alone. We never have to hurt alone because our God knows he cares and he listens. In the Bible alone, there are 367 verses on prayer. There are 650 prayers listed in the Bible. There are 450 recorded answers to prayers in the Bible. The Bible records Jesus praying 25 different times. Jesus models... Uh, how we should pray. In verses 7 through 12 today, he reminds his disciples to ask, seek, and knock. And when we do, we will receive, find, and the door shall be open. Consider this. When we think about the God of the Old Testament, he always proved faithful, right? When we think about the God of the New Testament, he always proved faithful. And we think about the God of today, he will always prove faithful because faithful is who he is. Faithful is what God is. If George Mueller can have 50,000 prayers answered, don't you know we serve the same God today? We can worship God knowing without a doubt that we serve a God who doesn't miss our calls, who doesn't hit the reject button, who doesn't put us on hold, but rather the God who gives good things, the God who is a good father, and the God who answers. If he brought you here today, my ultimate prayer is I pray you don't leave without knowing how faithful he is. Guess what you'll see here at Matthew's table? Answered prayers. You'll see all around answered prayers in this church. You'll see everywhere you go within this church, it's an answered prayer prayer. In the next year and years to come, I want to be able to get up here and testify to the time that we prayed and the times that God responded. I want to get up here and testify that our people that drifted came back home after we prayed. I want to get up here and testify that the one you was praying for repented and turned back to God. I want to get up here and testify to the change that we witnessed fall off. I want to get up here and testify to the families that we've seen restored. I want to get up here and testify that men started to leave their homes. I want to get up here and testify when, that prisoners turned to Jesus. I want to get up here and testify that people found freedom from addiction. I want to get up here and testify that we experienced revival, and I don't want it to be because we didn't ask, seek, and knock. Like, I don't want it to be we can't testify because we didn't go to God in prayer. Because we thought we had our own solutions and our own fixes. Guess what? We can't fix it. We can't fix the problems. 
We know the God who can, though. And the question that I asked us is, why do we not go to him more often? Why do we try to create our own solutions and our own answers and we treat God like the famous Verizon commercial? Do you hear me now? He hears you quite clear. Psalms 18.6, what did it say? In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. What was his answer? From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him. My cry to him reached his ears. Let's spend this last song praying and praising to a faithful God and meditating upon this old hymn. Like think about this old hymn and what it's saying. What a friend that you have in Jesus. Like what a friend that I have in Jesus. What a friend that you have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. You struggling this morning? You pray. You hurting this morning? You pray. You drifting this morning? We pray. Whatever it is you're facing this morning, do not walk out of here without praying to the God who has the solution. We have a, a prayer team. We have a prayer room. We have a prayer table. And guess what? More than that, we have a book. I was in the prayer room earlier, and it says, Prayers That God Has Answered. Like, in 10 years from now, we're going to have testimonies of Matthew's table of the time they prayed in the time that God answers because we, we serve the God of the Old Testament, we serve the God of the New Testament, and we serve the God who is faithful. Amen. Let it not be because we didn't pray that God didn't answer because he tells us to ask, seek, and knock, and we, were, we will receive fine and the door will be open. Let's worship. you guys would like to stay connected to us and what we're doing you can subscribe to our youtube channel or you can like us on facebook you can also visit our website at matthewstableonesboro.com a cool feature on our website is we have a prayer wall you can place your prayer on there and someone will be praying for you to partner with us financially you can text the number 73256 with matthew's table with no space in between because of your giving we can be a missional church that reaches the laws and goes hits the streets for Jesus. Thank you.